All right, let's get started. I'm gonna go through a general overview of the program and its history, and then get into more of the specifics of the application. And if you have questions along the way, you can feel free to send those in the chat box and Lauren Jones will be um, assisting me with either answering those questions or alerting me that there's a question. So just some program background. The program was created in 1990 and we've awarded over $26 million to date. Now in 2016, there was some uh, funding formula changes. It's now a per page fee collected by the Register of Deeds. No county pays into the fund more than $30,000 per year. The statute requires that the funds be distributed across Kansas equally um, or as best we can. And half of the funds need to go to either cities, counties, or local historical societies. Through this program, um, we've been able to um, help communities realize their preservation goals and increase the interest in their historic resources. So here's some numbers. The maximum amount awarded is $90,000 with the minimum ask of $5,000. Generally speaking, the reimbursements will be up to 80% of costs and the recipients are expected to provide 20% match. Now for-profit corporations is a 50-50 match. Remember, this is a reimbursement grant, so the cash must be matched, um, or the grant must be matched with cash and not with indirect costs or in-kind services. The cash match must be available no later than November 2nd, 2020, which is the grant deadline this year. Now, properties that are eligible to apply for the grant need to be listed on the National Register, State Register of Historic Places, or contribute to a national or state listed district. Now, remember, some districts have non-historic or non-contributing properties in their district. Those do not qualify for the grant. It needs to be listed as contributing or individually. And if you're unsure of your property listing, you can either email us at kshs at shpo at ks.gov, or you can give us a call at 785-272-8681, extension 240. You can also search our online searchable database, which is khri.kansasgis.org. And all of these notes will be in the recorded presentation that'll be posted on the website later, maybe next week. And the properties cannot be owned by state or federal governments. They're not eligible. The applicant must own the property. There's some, a few exceptions, for example, a cemetery, but you still need to make reasonable effort to locate the owner or owners and get their permission in an agreement. All owners must consent to the application in writing. So different types of um, owner examples could be a private owner, it could be a nonprofit, the local or county governments, and then for-profit corporations. And if there's more than one owner, all property owners need to agree in writing and provide that as documentation in the application. Now, for-profit corporation owners need to um, provide a little bit more documentation as to uh, why the continued existence is threatened and why the rehabilitation of the property is not economically feasible without the grant assistance. So there's gonna be more eligible activities listed in the program information on our website, but some examples of what are, is eligible. We have um, rehabilitation, that's updating existing features to make it usable for future use. 
Um, that could be upgrading the HVAC system, remodeling a bathroom, et cetera. Restoration is reconstructing any missing features, but if you're gonna be a, um, submitting your application for a restoration project, you must provide documentation of the missing features that you're looking to reconstruct. Preservation is maintaining it as it exists. And that's maintaining or repairing historic materials or activities that um, prevent it from further deterioration. Now this could be site um, preservation. Um, in the example of an archeology span project, um, for erosion control, et cetera. And then also some non-construction activities are eligible. Um, historic structures reports, maintenance plans, construction plans, but those can also be coupled with the rehabilitation work. All work needs to conform to the Secretary of Interior Standards for treatments of historic properties. And the link is um, in the presentation um, and also the link is on our website. And while some um, of these activities are eligible activities, some are more successful or compete better than others. For example, a roof caving in is going to um, compete better than a private individual's kitchen remodel, for example. And no work um, should begin on the project until the grants are awarded in February 2021 at the Historic Sites Board of Review meeting. And the grant administrator has to attend an orientation session and there needs to be a signed grant agreement. Some ineligible activities with which there are more listed in the program information. That's additions, interpretive displays or panels. There's other grants for um, interpretive uh, projects. Any equipment purchases like computers or um, a genie to help with your project. Um, any major reconstructions or purchase of property, grant administration expenses, and general maintenance. Now, general maintenance is at the discretion of the grant review committee. Keep in mind, there's an expected level of maintenance um, towards maintaining the building. For example, touching up paint or cleaning out gutters. Those would not be eligible expenses. Do we have any questions so far on that? All right. Again, this is a reimbursement program. Grantees are expected to be able to maintain the cash flow to pay consultants and contractors as they come due. And then ask for reimbursement only when the um, line item or um, specific project is complete 100%. Documentation of the payment is required when you request the reimbursement. And we do try to process those reimbursement requests as quickly as possible, but it's important to make sure you have the cash on hand to maintain the project. Okay. After the award, grantees have to sign a grant a project agreement, and that just spells out the um, terms of the grant the scope of work, the schedule, reimbursement criteria, and other conditions of the grant. And it also includes the approved budget line items, which you will um, get reimbursed on. And we'll talk through that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, grant administrators are expected to attend an orientation where we go into detail um, more um, of the grant administration side. And then also they submit the monthly progress reports so we can see what's happening with the project throughout its duration. And no project work can begin until all of these things are completed. So here are some deadlines. The deadline for final applications this year is November 2nd by end of day, 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. And you can see the program information for new submission instructions, and I'll go through those as well. We do accept preliminary drafts of the application 
up until September 30th. And that just gives you time to take the corrections and um, comments into your final application. And then the awards are not announced until about 20, um, February of 2021 at the Historic Sites Board of Review meeting. Although we have not announced those dates yet, but it'll be sometime in the beginning of 2021. So this year we are going um, to an online format um, through this portal called Submittable. Um, you need to be able to create a submittable login account and then you select apply to begin the application. Now this allows you to invite collaborators to help you on the application so you can have more than one person working on it. And you can also save your draft and continue work later. Now it's important that you read the program information before you start the application and carefully read each section as you're filling it out before you submit it. And they need to be submitted through the online submittable platform. You can see um, the website link where the application is found and also the program information. Now I'm gonna go step-by-step step through the application and if you've applied in the past, the questions will be familiar, but it's in the new format online. So it begins with some just basic information about the legal property owner and the property. A, section A is the applicant. This is the legal owner of the property as of November 2nd, 2020, and will remain the owner throughout the duration of the project plus five years from the date of the project closeout. Again, if the project has more than one owner, you can provide proof of that later in an attachment in section P of the application. Section B gives the property's historic name, legal street address, including the zip code, and if applicable, the city and county to which the property is located. Section C is where you would enter the name and address of the person who will be overseeing the grant. That's your grant administrator. If an organization is applying, the contact name is a representative authorized to conduct its business. And if the contact person is not the grant administrator, explain that in section M later. And make sure the person listed as the grant administrator knows that you're listing them as the grant administrator. They will be our point of contact and they'll be responsible for progress reports and other specific project correspondence. Section D is the applicant status. Are you an individual, local government, county, um, for-profit corporation? And if you're unsure of your status, you can just contact us and we can work through this question. Section E, again, is what um, your property is listed as. Is it a National Historic Landmark? Is it listed in the National Register or State Register individually? Or is it a contributor to a historic district? So that's Section E. And then if it's in a historic district, please list that um, in the Historic District Name section. Again, if you're not sure of your property name or listing status, you can always contact us and we can help you. Section F is kind of the Sparks Notes version of your grant. You wanna provide a very brief overview of the project for which you're seeking funding. For example, funding is needed to address the 24 original windows in the Smith House. The windows are suffering from rot and deterioration. It gives the specific number of windows and what is wrong with it. And don't worry about explaining the need for the grant as that'll come up later in the application. And you'll note there's always been a character limit in the application, but the online submission will um, tell you when you've reached your character limit um, and each section is required. Um, so section G is why 
is your property unique? And um, explain how the property um, is important in Kansas history at the local, state, or national level. And remember, all the properties applying for this grant are already listed on the register. So just saying that is needs further explanation. You can always look to the, its National Register or Kansas Register listing applic uh, nomination for some background on your property that you could include in the historical significance section. Again, you want to highlight what makes your property unique. Section eight deals with community benefit and support. You want to be sure to summarize how the community is supporting your project and then you're backing it up later in the application with letters of support. Section I really is the meat of the application. It's talking about the condition of the property and the urgency of the preservation work. What might happen if the property is not funded with the grant? Um, describe the most urgent current preservation needs and generally exterior envelope um, projects compete better because it's gonna provide the best preservation for the building rather than working um, on a floor project when really it's your roof that needs replacing. And we can help you with the preliminary application process, helping you work through the preservation needs. And the state statute that created the grant lays out certain things for the grant committee to consider um, when awarding grants. And the condition of the property and the urgency of the preservation work proposed is one of those things. And often this urgency piece is the most critical to the grant committee. So make sure that is in section I. Section J talks about the endangerment of the property. Explain um, why it's so urgent that this work be done now. Um, explain how your proposed project will address these endangerment um, and how it will protect the property. What might happen if you don't address the urgency problem? And how is this grant going to help in your preservation project? Section K deals with financial need. State your case for why you need this grant and why the grant committee should fund yours over all other grants. So this is where you can talk about work you've already done maybe other grants or tax credits. Maybe you've completed most of the work and you just need funding to complete the small section of your project. Are you seeking other funding sources? Maybe you have a local Main Street group that's giving you some funds and you can couple those. Are you applying for tax credits? We have a um, rehabilitation uh, tax credit program at the state and federal level. So we can um, definitely talk through those. Are you getting loans or grants from other sources? And maybe your project isn't eligible for other funding sources. For example, a landscape project for erosion control wouldn't be an eligible tax credit project. And so you'll want to state that in this section. Section L deals with the match requirements. This is a reimbursement grant, so you need to be able to demonstrate that you have at least the 20% match and also that you have money to maintain the cash flow until you receive that reimbursement. And if you're a for-profit uh, corporation, you would provide the documentation that you have 50% of the match. And what kind of form of documentation is it a loan agreement, a cash savings, another grant? Maybe you have a donor who is pledging, you would want to provide that. But you need to make sure to demonstrate that you have the cash on hand. And maybe you don't have $100,000 to maintain the whole project, but we will break it up into smaller line items that you'll be able to get reimbursed for and move it on to the next line item. 
And we'll talk through that in the next couple slides. Now, section M talks about your applicant's administrative ability. Make sure the person knows and wants the role of grant administrator. And the grant committee is taking into consideration the administrative ability of the applicant. So you wanna really make sure that you demonstrate the administrative ability of your grant administrator. What experience do they have? Have they worked on previous grant projects? Um, and then it's someone who should be able to work with the project team and with us at the SHPO. They need to be able to maintain records, provide monthly progress reports, and it's someone you expect to stay with the project through the duration. Section N deals with your project schedule, budget, and scope of work. This is the one place on the application that you can attach additional pages. Note, there is a character limit for this box, but you can feel free to attach additional pages. And the grant review committee needs to know what you're doing, how you're doing it, when you plan to do it, timeline, and how much you think it's going to cost. And this is the basis of your grant agreement if the project is funded. So you want to make sure the information is accurate to the best of your ability. Now that may um, require you to get estimates from consultants or contractors, and that's okay. You wanna itemize out your proposed budget and the schedule in as much detail as you know at the moment, and it'll be flushed out later if awarded. Again, this is the only part of the application where you'll be able to provide additional information for the section. Um, and this schedule and draft budget is the basis for your project agreement. Consider the breakdown of your budget carefully. These are the line items for which reimbursements will be based. Now here's an example of um, a project schedule and budget. So the masonry rep repairs, 36528 and you expect that to be completed March 2020. The roof, you can't really break down a roof into a smaller line item. Um, you will have to request the reimbursement for that total 22,000. Whereas other projects like windows may be able to be broken down into smaller line items for cash flow purposes. And any work described in this section must follow the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. Again, you can contact us for um, any questions or we'll comment on it during the preliminary stages. And if funded, reimbursement requests have to be 100% complete for that specific line item. Um, it needs to be outlined in the grant agreement and during the grant period. Needs to meet the Secretary of Interior standards. Photos of the completed work must be submitted. And then proof of payment and, and the invoice. Now, setup fees, um, mobilization fees, those are not eligible line items by themselves, but can be included in a total line item. So for example, um, say your project involves window rehabilitation. What's not recommended if you don't have the cash flow is to remove all 12 windows, repair offsite, and then reinstall. Now, we wouldn't be able to reimburse for the removal of those 12 windows. We wouldn't be able to reimburse until the windows are reinstalled. But you could break it down into six windows at a time. And that's what we recommend for cash flow purposes. However, it may be easier for the contractor to do, to do the work in a different way. Asking your contractor to do the work based on a line item in your budget may mean the cost is higher. So just keep that in mind. And again, we can't reimburse for work that's not 100% complete. That means the walls need to be closed up, the roof on and finished, and windows installed, etc. 
So if awarded, we will withhold a 10% retainage from each reimbursement and the total um, retainage will be given back to the grantee once the project is 100% complete and we've received all the supporting documentation and our sign back. Grantees are also encouraged to withhold a 10% retainage with their contractors um, as it provides some assurances that the work's going to be completed as outlined in the contract. So just here's a, um, a breakdown of that example. Say that your contractor bills you for $10,000 for the west side windows. Your contract allows you to withhold 10% retainage. That means you're paying the contractor $9,000. So for your reimbursement, you would submit the $10,000 invoice and your proof of payment of $9,000. Now we're not gonna hold your retainage from you that you have with your contractor. So we're gonna take 80% of that invoice, which is $8,000. Then we're gonna take out our 10% retainage. So that's $800. The $8,000 minus the $800 gives you your reimbursement amount of $7,200. Does anyone have questions on that? I know it can be a little tricky. Yes. Okay. What's your question, sir? Or are you typing it in the questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself. Are there any specific questions about this? You can always feel free to email or call us later if you wanna talk through it in more detail also. Okay, so because we use this grant to match our federal funds that support our other programs, we are required to follow the same grant requirements as federal funding. This means we have to follow competitive bidding processes for any products or services over $5,000. And those are outlined in the uh, program information as Appendix A and B. And whether you're um, requiring the assistance of a consultant or qualified contractor, the competitive bidding process must be followed in a matter, um, manner consistent with the HTF policies described in your project agreement and also outlined in Appendix A and B. If it's under $5,000, competitive bidding is not required, but there will still be um, contract requirements that are required by the HTF grant. So ideally the grant applicants will wait for notice of their grant award and then seek approval of preliminary scopes of work by us before putting the project out to bid. But some projects um, will need upfront coordination with a consultant or contractor. Um, so if you end up doing the bidding before grant award is awarded, the uh, documentation of the competitive bidding process needs to be submitted to um, us for review. That the award was chosen through an open and fair competitive process. And then if you're using services of an architect or engineer, you'll only include this in your um, proposed budget if they're intending to be reimbursed through the HTF grant. Now we understand that some projects that involve structural stabilization or restoration of missing features will generally, generally require services of a professional consultant. And these services may be reimbursed by the grant or can be paid through other sources. Projects that are smaller, that involve simpler repairs or replacement in kind, 
don't generally require the services of a consultant. But here you see outlined an example of what might be um, reimbursed for by the grant from an architect. They can help you develop plans and specifications. They can assist with the bidding process and oversee construction. And make sure to make the investment in hiring a good consultant. So here's um, the budget example we had before, but we've broken it down into um, how we'll want it submitted in the application. So you want to take the subtotal of construction costs. That totals $64,372 in this example. And then you're going to take 20% of construction costs, not the total costs, just the total of your construction costs. So 20% of that $64,000 is $12,874 in this example. Then you'll add in those consultant fees to get your total project of $92,916. You'll then take 80% of the grant request and that, or 80% of the total, and that is your grant request. So here is what it's gonna look like on the submittable application. So you'll wanna put the estimated project completion date here. And then in this box, there's formulas that'll do most of the math for you. Um, so you'll put in your subtotal of the construction costs, not including any consultant services. And then it'll give you the 20% of that cost. You'll add in the consultant fees if it's being reimbursed by the HTF grant. And that's going to give you your total project cost. Now, the 80% or the grant request, you'll have to fill out yourself because if you're a for-profit corporation, it could be 50% of your project cost. Or say your project is over you know, 200,000, your grant request can only be $90,000. So that's the maximum that you can put in this spot. Are there any questions about the budget and fact um, figuring out the budget? I, I do have a question. Um, hi, this is Robin Rosenberg. Um, <laughs> if we're supposed to get the, the estimates after we get the award, like wishfully speaking, um, where are we supposed to come up with the numbers to make the specific request for the award? So you can reach out to um, a local contractor or consultant that maybe has familiarity with the project to get estimates, but um, you won't be able to hire them outright. You'll have to go through the bidding process and you aren't required to take the lowest bid. Um, you just have to go through that open and fair bidding process. Does that make sense? So you may have to talk with a consultant or contractor to get those estimate costs before um, knowing if you're awarded the grant and that's okay and you just can't sign any contracts or um, begin work before the grant is awarded so if um, if we say have a list of 10 projects um, that we think are that qualify that would far exceed the ninety thousand dollars but since we're based on estimates, if some come in lower, can others move up on the list to be covered? Should we put in for more than, like, I, I'm, does that? So I think you're talking about, um, maybe you have a whole rehabilitation project and there's multiple things. You've got windows, you've got your roof, you have flooring. You want to make sure that your most preservation priority for urgency is what is the top of your list, but you can also include other things. So for example, say you have water damage on your plaster and your floor inside, but it's caused by a leaky roof. So we would expect you to request grant funds for the roof, but you can also include that plaster and flooring repair in the project. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we talked a little bit before about letters of, um, letters of support. And you wanna keep your letters to a minimum. We typically see anywhere between 45 and 60 applications per year. So the grant, or the grant committee is gonna be reading 45 to 60 applications and letters of support. So you wanna make sure that they um, show the community support and benefit. Letters from Congress and politicians can sometimes be effective, but letters from people with a personal connection to the property generally have more impact. And then your preservation plan. This is a um, one to two page summary, but can also be a more comprehensive report if you have one. Um, and it's just to summarize the preservation needs and what you have planned maybe after the grant. Um, if you don't have a preservation plan right now, now is a good time to think about it. Um, even a list of future wants and needs is a good start. You wanna lay out um, plans for preservation of the building. It's important that you can show that you're thinking beyond the grant. Can everyone please mute themselves? I'm getting some echo. Thank you. Um, okay, so photos are really important because the grant committee may not be familiar or as familiar with the property as you are. So you wanna make sure that um, your photos convey the property overall and also it includes um, what you're requesting in the grant. You can include a historic photo if you're reconstructing a feature or to show the level of deterioration. And also photos should be color and show the architectural features clearly. You as the applicant are solely responsible for the clarity of the photos and or photocopies. And because we're using the online submission, it's gonna be a little bit different this year. You'll wanna um, label your photos in the file, um, file name carefully. You could number them. You can make sure it says um, plaster deterioration on west wall. You know, make sure that the label of the photo conveys what's going on in the photo. The photos consistently make or break the application. So make sure that you include photos um, and you won't be able to include more than 20 images. And I'm gonna show some examples after this slide, but um, you will be able to include um, Word document files, PDFs, JPEGs. So if you feel that it's gonna be easier to demonstrate the work in a document where you can add some labels or arrows, then you can feel free to do that. Um, if the um, grant is awarded to you, we will ask for JPEGs um, formatted photos for our records. So you wanna make sure the first photo the grant committee sees is the overall pretty shot. This is what we call the three corner shot. It's taken from the corner, it shows the front facade, maybe another side, and then also some context. And then you wanna go into detail about what you're requesting the grant committee to fund. Um, they can be close up photos, they can have, like I said, arrows or circles showing the deterioration, and that can be helpful sometimes because the grant committee may not be able to see um, what you're specifically asking about. You can use rulers or pencils to um, illustrate damage like rotten wood or soft plaster. You can send photos of buckets to catch the water from leaking roofs, um, levels that show the uneven floor. We've seen it all, um, but it might better illustrate the problems. Or you can call out the problem in the notes or the file name. We've even seen the use of drones, lifts, or other means to show um, levels of damage or deterioration that
that may otherwise be hard to reach areas. Like this example, they used a drone. And remember, the grant reviewers are gonna be looking at a lot of applications. So piling multiple images onto one page may cause more confusion than clarity. So in our previous example, there was a few callouts. This may be too many. And the grant reviewers are using these photos to familiarize themselves with the projects. If they can't see what needs to be repaired, how will they know to grant you the HTF funds? And also be careful to show details with perspectives or in relation to other objects. A picture, a close-up photo of white plaster wall is not gonna convey a lot of information. Are there any questions on photo requirements or documentation? Okay. So um, on our website, you'll see the assurances page. It's with the link um, for the program information and also the application um, link. Make sure you read this, sign it, and attach it at the end of the application. Number five is important to remember. The grantees are expected to pay all project costs before they seek reimbursement for the portion of that section. And then also section six um, requires owners to maintain ownership of the property for five years following the completion of the grant. Owners must maintain the grant funded work during that five year period and any work five years after closeout will be reviewed by um, us at the SHPO. All right, have you um, convinced the reviewers that you um, should be given the funds? Have you had someone else read your application to make sure that it makes sense? And then you can always reach out to us either before you start the application or during the preliminary review phases um, for some technical assistance. And then be sure to take advantage of the preliminary review. Um, and any uh, preliminary should be submitted to us by September 30th through the online uh, platform submittable. And I'm gonna go over to our website to show you how to access this. So I'm gonna stop sharing this. And I'm gonna share my screen. So this is our um, main web page. And under the preserve tab, if you hover, you'll be able to see help for property owners and grants. So you'll click on grants, heritage trust fund. And this is the 2021 uh, grant round. So you've got your program information the assurances form, which you'll need to um, sign and attach. And then the uh, application, which is through submittable. So um, this is the landing page for the grant. You'll be able to invite um, other people to work on the application with you. It gives a little bit of background. It also provides the links to the workshop so this recording will be posted on the web page here at this link. And then the assurances form is found at this link. So it gives you the information. And then I'm already logged in, but you'll have to create an app, um, a login for submittable to be able to access the application. But it's everything that we just went through, including um, attachments for, um, budget information and photos, documentation of ownership. Again, if you have multiple owners, you could provide that documentation there. Um, you can also provide the deed record showing the legal property address in this section, documentation of the match.
Um, and I'm going to share my screen one more time. Here's our contact information if you have any questions. There's our um, email, our website that has that program information, assurances page, and um, application information is at this web link. And then you can always give us a call um, at our office. Any final questions? And you can also, um, put questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to those. Um, I have a question about um, grants. Can grants be combined and stacked with tax credits for the project? Absolutely. So the tax credits provide, um, can only be taken on the matched portion of the grant. So say you have a $100,000 $100,000 in work, you get a $90,000 grant, $10,000 plus your 20% match would be what's eligible for tax credits. So grant funds, insurance monies, those are not eligible um, for tax credits. Um, and tax credits are um, transferable in the state of Kansas. So if you're a nonprofit and don't pay taxes, you can sell those for cash they usually sell on 80 to 90 cents on the dollar. And if you have further tax credit questions, we can talk through that process um, through email or over the phone. Are there other questions? Well, we hope that you found this um, informational um, and good luck. Uh, you can always give us a call you can submit your preliminary application starting now up until September 30th. We encourage that. It gives time for us to provide feedback and we'll reopen it for you to submit the final application. Any applications through the submittable portal that are received after October 1st, we'll assume those are final applications and not preliminary because we want to give you time to take our comments and put them into your application. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to stop recording. Or Lauren, can you stop recording?